UPG, SPG, and VPG have become synonymous in modern pagan traditions with divine experiences and categorizing them according to the likelihood that they were genuine rather than misinterpretations on the part of the worshiper. There are numerous ways that gods interact with us. They could send omens to people to tell them of future events or to change course from current decisions that they were exploring. Divination from numerous methods would fall in this category. They could give us blessings or, in rare cases of divine wrath or agos, mess things up in our lives. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the third major way that the gods interact with us. Direct divine experiences, where the gods appear in some form, epiphania, encapsulate a broad collection of divine interactions. An individual's epiphonic experience with a god could initiate them into a mystery cult, birth a new local cultus and sanctuary site, or even drive the person to lifelong devotion and service to that god. In other words, yes, the gods called ancient people, and there's no reason to think that they ever stopped. Let's take a look at divine epiphany. Kaerete. The English word epiphany has lost a lot of its ancient Greek roots and meaning, but I think that there might be use in bringing it back into Hellenist discourse or pagan discourse generally. In the modern day, people often see epiphanies as internal realizations or ideas that dawn on them, conclusions reached about things that feel sudden and spontaneous. The Greek word epiphania is far more external. It referred to a range of experiences that denoted the presence of a god, from appearing in a mortal flesh disguise, to appearing as a phasma or spectral form, to appearing in animal form, to manifesting as divinely ordained natural disasters, to manifesting within statues that move or speak, to appearances in dreams, to the absence of important symbols that denoted them from their temples or other sacred spaces. There were qualities in each of these kinds of experiences that marked them as separate and special, and we'll get into those in the first section, but the fact remains that in ancient times the range of divine experiences folks had and honored was wide and varied, and often matches up with divine experiences modern worshippers still have to this day. And the way these experiences were confirmed looks a bit different than the way that modern pagan communities tend to confirm their experiences today. This video will be divided into two parts. The first will cover historical epiphania with various examples, and the second will cover the ancient and modern systems of confirmation and how the two systems differ. I hope that this will start a robust conversation on some of the issues that I see with the modern confirmation system of UPG, SPG, VPG, and how we might deal with those issues without using the utility that the system is supposed to give to us. With that out of the way, let's get into historical epiphanies. Part 1. How the Gods Visit Us the word epiphania primarily came into use in the 3rd century BCE and later to reference divine experiences, though the Greek word it is built on, phino, means to make visible, bring light to, or make known, and it was present in Homer and Hesiod and often referenced appearances of the divine, sometimes with the prefix epi or in. I'm largely going to use the term epiphany for the rest of this video because of this to refer to divine experiences of a certain kind, so let's define it to start. In her incredible monograph on the topic of divine epiphany, Georgia Petrodo defines epiphany as a manifestation of a deity to an individual or group of people, in sleep or waking reality, in a crisis or cult context. The deity may appear as anthropomorphic, enacted, effigies, synecdoche, or symbols of the divine, or extreme natural disasters, amorphous. The perception of the deity's epiphany may be sensorial, i.e. the perceiver may see, hear, feel, or even smell the deity, or intellectual, i.e the perceiver may be aware of the deity's presence without seeing or hearing anything. Witnesses to the epiphany may be humans, animals, other gods, or even just the natural world as a whole. Yeah, that's a lot, so let's break it down a little bit. Epiphanies are specifically when the gods make themselves known to us, so something like an omen that a god sent without their presence would not be an epiphany. There's a huge diversity in how they manifest, and we'll get into each of these categories in a moment. These manifestations were incredibly important for worshippers, and typically happened either in a cult context, i.e. during religious functions in either public or private, or in the context of a crisis, such as wartime, health crisis, travel in the wild that entailed danger, or other situations in which the livelihood of the individual or the polis were in danger. Epiphanies are different from omens, which are signs sent by the gods, but which do not denote their direct presence. Trust me, I'm still working on a future set of videos on omens. The topic is broad and massive, and it's going to take a hot minute to finish all of my research. And yes, I know I've been promising that video since the beginning of the channel. For those of you have been around for a while, but I'm working on it. 
let's take a look at the various kinds of epiphanies and the context in which they appeared. The first sort, anthropomorphic, is likely what first springs to mind when you think about the manifestation of a deity. This refers to when the gods disguise themselves as physical human people, such as when Demeter disguised herself as an old woman while wandering the earth during the Homeric hymn to Demeter, or when Athena disguised herself as mentor during the Odyssey while accompanying Odysseus's son Telemachus to Troy. It was thought in ancient times that directly perceiving the gods without a disguise or some kind of barrier, such as a spectral manifestation, which we'll talk about later, would do direct damage to humans. In the Iliad 20, 125 through 130, Hera tells Poseidon and Athena that all we are come down from Olympus to mingle in this battle, that Achilles take no hurt among the Trojans for this day's space, but thereafter shall he suffer whatever fate spun for him with her thread at his birth when his mother bare him. But if Achilles learn this not from some voice of the gods, he shall have dread hereafter when some god God shall come against him in battle, for gods are dangerous when they manifest openly. Semele was destroyed by Zeus when she sees him in his true divine form. Heresias was blinded when he accidentally laid eyes on Athena's naked form, and Acteon was turned into a deer and hunted by his own dogs for laying eyes on Artemis in her true form. Perceiving a god directly, even in a vision, can cause madness and immense suffering for a human viewer in the ancient worldview, and thereby the gods must contain themselves in a human-like disguise even when appearing in dreams and visions for us. That said, it's also clear that the gods can't quite get all of their divine awesomeness into the human form, and for the pious and perceptive, there are many tells. One of the big ones is found in the word Epiphania itself. Phino means to reveal, see, or make known, and itself derives from pha, which comes from the Indo-European root for glowing, glimmering, or shining. The gods were often said to have shining eyes, an otherworldly glow, or other tells in their disguises that a pious worshiper would perceive and find themselves in awe of. In Iliad 3, 396-399, when Aphrodite comes to Helen in the guise of her maid, she tells Helen to go back to Alexander and Helen recognizes her. So spake she, and stirred Helen's heart in her breast, and when she marked the beauteous neck of the goddess, her lovely bosom, and her flashing eyes, then amazement seized her, and she spake, addressing her, stating, Strange goddess, why art thou minded to beguile me thus? The glowing, flashing eyes are here, but so is the second major marker, the otherworldly beauty of the gods, especially the goddesses. Helen notes the gorgeous neck, bosom, and otherworldly eyes poking out from behind the wrinkled flesh disguise of the goddess, almost as though human flesh is a costume that is just a bit too small to fully cover her divinity. Telemachus recognizes Athena in the guise of Mentes, quote, in his heart, unquote, in Odyssey Book One. He notes her stature and comeliness, even when disguised as a man, and her swift departure in the manner of a bird confirms for him once and for all that she's definitely a goddess. Even while disguised as humans, the gods can choose only to appear to one or some humans. Later in the Odyssey, Athena appears to Odysseus and makes him look, quote, like a god, unquote, to his son Telemachus, appearing only to him and not to his pious son or the pious servant that gave him a gracious reception despite his poverty. And if a human is particularly impious, they might not perceive the god at all. Pentheus in Euripides' Bacchae asked the stranger, who is Dionysus in disguise, trying to spread his own cult in the area, and where is he then, this god of yours, eh? Dionysos answers him, here by my side, but you can't even see him, let alone understand him. So it's pretty clear for an individual to perceive the gods, they must either have some kind of relationship with them prior, or the gods must have some use for them in the moment. In the case of Demeter appearing to Metanera in the Homeric hymn, it's pretty clear that she didn't have a strong relationship with her household to begin with, but instead needed somewhere to deal with her grief. When Metanera upsets her and she reveals her true form, she chastises the folly of mortals in the attempt to prevent her to making Metanera's son immortal and, quote, when she had so said, the goddess changed her stature and her looks, thrusting old age away from her, beauty spread round her, and lovely fragrance was wafted from her sweet-smelling robes, and from the divine body of the goddess a light shone afar, while golden tresses spread down over her shoulders, so that the strong house was filled with brightness as with lightning. And so she went out from the palace, and straight away Metanera's knees were loosed, and she remained speechless for a good long while, and did not remember to take up her late-born son from the ground. That must have been a pretty terrifying manifestation for such a concerned mother to fall for her knees, mute, and forget about her sobbing child that she had just been so vigorously defending a moment before. 
We see the elements of light, extreme beauty, and terror here, but also a sweet-smelling scent, which her robes were apparently helping to conceal. All of these things, when present together, mark a definitely corporeal manifestation of a god. If you encounter someone who you believe might have been a god, one of the surefire ways to know is to try to make eye contact and see if the person's eyes have an otherworldly quality that make you want to look away, or if their departure is so rapid that you can't explain it through worldly means. These types of manifestations were said to be very common in wild places, between civilization, during travel, on the slopes of mountains, and on shorelines. All of these are liminal spaces where the boundaries between society and the wild are blurred, or where the wild itself rules. Caves particularly are associated with manifestations of the nymphs and Pan, who would call people to their service. If you're curious about nymph cults and pan cults, check out my video on Mania where I talk about these encounters more in depth. The Mosai were frequently said to call people to their service, either while traveling or while on mountainsides, particularly Quiteron and Elegon. This isn't just limited to Hesiod and Theogony either. Archilochos was said to have been initiated by the muses and human guys out in the countryside while traveling to a new Deme. Hecate was also known to manifest and terrify folks while traveling. The big thing that all of these encounters have in common is that they frequently happen midday, at the height of the day's heat, which is also when offerings were most frequently given to the dead, and that they all happen in liminal spaces where the seeming dominance of humanity had been broken. There's a reason so many shepherds, travelers, and rural folks became poets. Experiences of divine manifestations were said to produce thalma, or wonder, but also deus, or the fear where you're split between wonder and awe and absolute terror. This is the reaction we see with Metanira and other examples throughout this section, where humans are struck with simultaneous awe and terror at the appearance and existence of the gods, and is another hallmark of this class of epiphany, though it can also be the hallmark of other types which we'll see later. The second kind of divine manifestation would be enacted epiphanies, which largely don't apply currently in the modern world, as these sorts of epiphanies were largely found in a ceremonial context through polis celebrations. Priests and priestesses were often selected for appointed positions based on how much their appearance mirrored that of the cult statues in the temples, in part because they would be dressed up as gods during certain ceremonies to play the role of the gods in the festivals. According to Pausanias, this was the case for the priest of Ismenian Apollon at Thebes, where, quote, a boy of noble family who is himself both handsome and strong is chosen as priest of Ismenian Apollo for a year. He is called the Laurel Bearer, for the boys wear wreaths of laurel leaves. According to Pausanias, an Aegeon, a young boy priest of Zeus Pais, or Zeus in his boyhood, would also be chosen of the most beautiful boys to keep a priesthood position until he begins to grow his beard and no longer resembles Zeus in his boyhood. Then they would need to appoint a new priest. There are a number of other examples of ritual impersonation of deities by exceptionally beautiful humans, and at times these impersonators would be perceived as being switched out for the gods themselves. There are also examples of humans acting out the part of gods in private or mystery cults in order to get closer to the divine such as in the Mysteries of Eleusis, where humans were said to dance the Mysteries of Star Movement to align themselves with Dionysos, or when the Iobakoi were said to act out dramas assigned the roles of Dionysos, Kore, Pelemon, Aphrodite, and Proteothemos under the direction of the priest. We see the replacement of the priests with the gods in drama, when Eskulos had Hera replace her own priestess in the fragments of the Xanthriae, and Euripides does the same with Dionysos in the Bacchae. Far more common in cult contexts were epiphanies by effigies, where the gods acted through their statues and other cult objects to communicate directly with their worshippers during or after a rite. Unlike in ancient Egypt, the ancient Greeks didn't think their gods were always inside of their statues all the time. Rather, they were more likely to reside there either on their sacred birthdays each month, when the rites were specifically being performed for them, during sacred cult contexts such as festivals or during emergencies, and other situations where offerings were directly happening. Apollon was only thought to be in his temple at Delphi a few days out of each year, and otherwise the temple remained closed to show the god was not in attendance. Keep in mind, Hesiod refers to offering to the gods daily in the morning and at night on sacred days at home so it's most likely that these rules didn't apply to cult statues and homes, at least in terms of residence. That said, there were a few conditions that marked an epiphany involving a cult statue or effigy. The first was the perception of animation of the statue, either through expressions or through speech that was thought to come directly from the statue. The second was the expectation of animation in a specific cult or crisis context, which we'll get to in a moment. And the last was when the representation or the statue of the deity posed the same danger for the viewers as the corporeal manifestation of a deity would. The earliest example of a statue responding in a cult context comes from the Iliad, when the priestess Theano lays a beautiful beautiful peplos on the knees of Athena's statue, and vows even more offerings in exchange for the death of Diomedes. Thus she spoke in her prayer, but Pallas Athena made signs of refusal. Well, how do we know it was her statue as opposed to the goddess herself? Well, in Greek, there isn't actually a different word for the statue as opposed to the god. That said, 
Plutarch and Dionysius of Helicarnassus gives us records of a talking statue that was said to have spoken in observable history, that of Tyche Genechia. When the women of Rome were rewarded for their contributions to the war against the Volscians by offering money and building a temple to Tyche, they decided to pitch in a good chunk of their own cash to add a second statue. It was inscribed with, Women, you have dedicated to me according to a custom dear to the gods, and both Plutarch and Dionysius report that the statue was said to have repeated the words upon its dedication. Dionysius specifically refers to this event as an epiphania of the goddess, so it's pretty clear by late antiquity that these types of events were seen as divine manifestations. The animated in the eyes of their beholders subcategory is interesting. Frequently, during festivals and the like, statues of gods or representations of the gods in the form of sacred objects would be carried in procession to symbolize a mythic event that was said to inspire the festival. Sacred hiera, or objects, of Demeter and Kore were accompanied in processions during the Eleusis as a prominent example, as were a statue of Dionysos so accompanied in the procession for the opening rite of the city Dionysia. Many of these sorts of festivals had a leaving and returning seasonal quality quality to them as well, as they often tied up with the cycles of the harvest. Frequently, an effigy-based epiphania would cross over with an onera, or dream epiphania, where the statue of a god would appear in the dreams of a worshipper and instruct them in some way. Dream-based epiphanies, of all the various subtypes, were the most common epiphanies for individuals, though they were frequently also said to affect entire poloi and mass during siege situations. This happened, according to Plutarch, to the people of Sisychus in the 3rd century BCE, when Athena appeared to many of the inhabitants of the city of Ilion, with part of her peplos torn away, stating that she had just gotten back from assisting the people of Sisychus. This came just after she had appeared in the dreams of one ex-priest of hers, Callicles, every night for a week, telling him to contact Ptolemy the help for the Siege of Rhodes. Asclepios primarily did his healing through prescriptions in dream incubation temples, where people would come and sleep in the beds in the temple and he would appear in the dreams with the treatment. Sometimes these epiphanies were also accompanied by effigy epiphanies, particularly if the treatment didn't work with some cultural prohibitions, such as when the Pythagoreans were prescribed meat as a solution to their ills. Athena Hagea appeared in the dreams of one Pyrrhos of Athens when he injured himself in Pericles' service. Pericles, according to Plutarch, was terrified he'd lose his more talented builder but Athena showed up in Pericles' dreams and healed the man easily, so Pericles dedicated a bronze statue of her next to her altar on the Acropolis. Another group particularly predisposed to dream epiphanies were poets and musicians in antiquity. Numerous gods, including but not limited to the muses, were said to appear in the dreams of these artists and instruct them on works that they were to create, sometimes even dictating lines. Artemidoros, who wrote the only surviving dream interpretation manual we have from antiquity, was ordered to write it by Asclepios, who is credited in the introduction as the co-author. Pindar was said to have a dream where, according to Himerios, Demeter approached him in his sleep and got after him for not composing a hymn for her, though according to Pausanias, it was Persephone. He died on the tenth day after the vision, but he was so determined to honor their orders that he showed up in the dreams of a relative to ensure that the hymn was completed. Sometimes the performance of a hymn demanded by a god could result in a reciprocal epiphany of disguised manifestation. Such happened in the case of Simonides of Chaos when he performed a hymn to the Dioscori for Scopas in Thessaly. Scopas cruelly said he'd only pay him half the agreed upon fee for the performance. Shortly afterward, a message came in and told Scopas that two young men awaited him at the door, and as he made his way to answer, his roof caved in, crushing Scopas and killing him along with several of his relatives. Another way that the gods manifest to human is through phasmata, which is a bit difficult to find, but are spectral forms that are similar to an eidolon, or a ghost, in that it's clearly not completely solid, but unlike the eidolon, can sometimes interact with the physical world. Phasmata always leave behind material traces of their presence similar to physical divine disguises, though they may not be fully human in some cases. The vast majority of these manifestations are seen by groups of people rather than a single individual. According to Herodotus, phasmata of armed men from Aegina were sent by the deity Iacos to aid the Greeks in the battle at Salamis in 480 BCE. This epiphania was accompanied by another manifestation of divine power according to Herodotus, that of the amorphous manifestation, or the divine ordinance of natural disasters. A great light was said to have flashed out from Eleusis, a sound in a voice filled the Thracian field down to the sea that was said to come from a large body of men escorting Iacos in procession. Then a cloud rose up from the land and came back down, as though the gods had decided to put on the festival that the battle had forced to 
cancellation of just before the Vasmata. Zeus Panarmos was said to have manifested as a lightning bolt that set the camps of the Parthians on fire in 39 BCE at Stratonica, according to an inscription that commemorated the event. The Parthians launched a second attack and were afflicted with a deep fog and a second lightning storm much worse than the first. Artemis was said to have manifested in the Battle of Salamis as bright moonlight under the full moon, far brighter than was typical for the time, to assist the Greeks in this monumental task. She was given the epithet Munikia for this, as the battle was fought on the 16th day of Munikion, which became sacred to her ever after. Poseidon was frequently said to manifest as earthquakes when displeased, and propitiation offerings would be given to stop the quakes and save the city from whatever it offended him. While we're on the topic of how the gods shapeshift and manifest in ways that aren't anthropomorphic, it's interesting to note that Demeter, Kore, and Dionysos were all said to manifest best as their particular agricultural teammate. Dionysos was sometimes referred to as the wine, and in the bake is dwelling within the vines and grapes themselves in a field. Many of the oinokoe, or wine vessels holding the fermenting wine, were shaped like Dionysos holding a cup or other drinking vessel. On Mount Lerision in Laconia, Dionysos was said to be present when someone found an early ripe bunch of wine grapes just before the advent of his festival. Frequently, Demeter and Kore were addressed as flour, bread, and wheat themselves in various festivals. Far more frequently, frequent are the mythic and cultic appearances of specific gods and heroes as animals. I did an entire video on snakes and snake hybrids in mythology, so I'm largely going to focus on cult here and manifestations aside from snakes, as the third part to that series is one I'm still focusing on working on in the future. Interestingly, although birds were often seen as omens in ancient Greece sent by the gods, it's pretty rare for the gods to manifest as birds in either myth or cult. Owls were of Athena, not Athena herself. Likewise with eagles and Zeus, corvids and Apollons, swans and Aphrodite. Though in some myths, Zeus turned himself into birds and other animals to get into the sheets with women when he wanted to bring new heroes in the world. That said, gods manifesting as snakes and other reptiles, as well as heroes manifesting similarly, were far more common. There are too many documented instances of this in the Asclepion to get into here, but suffice to say, snakes were both tools in healing for the god, and sometimes the form he chose to manifest in. Zeus was said to have sired several heroes, including Aratos from Sikion, in the shape of a snake. Cows and bulls were also a favorite manifestation for deities, particularly river deities, which were said to often take the form of bulls or have bull-like features features due to the loud sound roaring rivers make coursing through the landscape. Scamander bellows like a bull in the Iliad, Kephisos is said to take a bovine form in Ion, and Achelos is said to appear in bull form when trying to mate with Dianera. In fact, he takes the form of a snake and as a man with bull horns in the Trachinae when trying to woo Dianera. Dionysos is also said to manifest as a bull during certain festivals and mystery rites. This is referenced in the Bacchae toward the end when Pentheus, afflicted with double vision, sees and questions Dionysos on appearing as a bull who replies that Pentheus is seeing as he is meant to. Dionysos also appears as a snake in a number of mystery lights, though as I said, I'll get more into that in future videos in the snake series. Nymphs and muses were sometimes said to manifest as bees or honey. In Pindar's infancy, Philostratos claims that he was visited by bees who spun beeswax on his lips, so that he might be inspired with honey-sweet poetry. This makes sense, as the words of the muses and the nymphs were often compared to honey, and offerings of honey were given at nymph caves for divination. See my video on the muses for more ties between bees, poetic inspiration, and the Mosai. Another way the gods would manifest would be either through their sacred objects, or more frequently, through the absence of such. Aphrodite's yearly festival in Sicily was said to be signified by the nine-day return of a flock of doves from Libya each year. When the doves return, so too she returns to the city for the festival of Katagogia. In a battle context, Heracles' sacred weapons disappeared from his temple, the Heracleion, signifying that he was prepared to fight alongside the Greeks in the battle at Leuctra. Clearly, there was a wide range of experiences, recognized as divine in nature, and potential direct or symbolic manifestations of deity. Note that although I personally classify omens as a divine experience, they're getting their own video due to the sheer number of them that were recognized and interpreted throughout antiquity in a myth and cult context. They'll probably get several videos, knowing how deep I end up diving into these things. It's important to note that the manifestation of deities specifically seemed to largely be confined to groups, travel, or to special servants of deities, such as poets and the like. It wasn't unheard of that the gods would manifest to pious ordinary mortals, but the majority of folks who had heavily documented Epiphania were either in a crisis, such as a medical emergency or siege, or were priests, poets, musicians, or other artists engaged in regular reciprocity and service with the gods. The other context involved group festivals and sacrificial rites at temples where statues would appear. Most ordinary Epiphania happened in dreams, not as manifestations or visions, 
humans. And even the majority of those manifestations in the forms of animals or natural disasters happen in specific cult or emergency contexts. In other words, if most of your divine experiences have been dreams or blessings or omens and not direct manifestations, that's actually perfectly normal and in line with the average Greek experience in ancient times. The gods were intimately involved in ancient life, but not in the more flashy, showy ways we think of today when we think of epiphanies. They were typically small blessings, answered prayers, dreams on occasions, or in emergencies. If you've never had a divine experience or think you haven't, that seems to have been a thought in ancient times as well. It could be that you just haven't learned enough about omens yet to recognize them, or you might have difficulty forming pictures in your mind and so dreams might be difficult for you. The gods find other ways to communicate with us, so don't lose hope. With that in mind, let's take a look at one of the biggest questions I get on my channel and in my community, confirming epiphanies. Part two. Two Systems for Confirming Divine Experiences A large number of recorded epiphanies resulted in the establishment of new shrines in public or private cults, which I want to stress here, I'm using the anthropological definition of cults as systems of devotion or veneration towards specific deities or objects. Particularly post the 3rd century BCE, we have a number of examples of landowners receiving epiphanies that led to establishing private cult sites on their land, which they opened to the public either for a fee or for the benefit of the public on the whole. These epiphanies, whether individuals or in groups, if they were to establish a new cult would be confirmed at oracles like those at Delphi and Dodona. In fact, a number of the requests that we have surviving from Delphi and Dodona, as well as numerous examples in Herodotus, Plutarch, and other historians' works, specifically mention Delphi as conforming epiphanies that led to new cult sites and festivals. In other words, divine experiences classed as manifestations were taken incredibly seriously in ancient times, and their confirmation was largely determined by divination, either directly asking the oracles, or for folks who couldn't afford the services of the Montic priests and priestesses at the oracles, at lot oracles, or through wandering montes such as the Sibyls and the Bacchae. In later antiquity, sorties were documents sold based on knucklebone dice tosses or astragale for home divination by literate Greeks and Romans. We have modern versions of the sorties or lot divination practices in the modern day. Oracle cards, tarot, dice oracle lists for normal six-sided or other dice, translated ancient knucklebone dice oracles with astragalo you can get from places like Etsy, alphabet oracles, oracles based around the Delphic maxims. There are numerous forms of divination that you can employ to confirm your interpretation of a divine experience or omen, or to attempt to interpret if you're struggling with the interpretation following the epiphany. My video on divination covers a number of ancient divination methods in depth, although I'd like to note that I think that modern divination methods can be just as effective. Gods are gods. If you know your divination too well and are confident that you can interpret it in an unbiased way, use whatever tool you're comfortable with. Or if not, hire someone you think will be more objective. This is part of the expertise that Montes had even in ancient times. There's a second message of classification and verification of divine experiences used by many modern pagans across traditions, and that's the system of UPG, SPG, and VPG. UPG stands for unverified personal gnosis, or knowledge that you gain from a divine experience that you have alone. SPG stands for shared personal gnosis, or experiences shared by multiple people. The last, verified personal gnosis, is a divine experience or knowledge gleaned with one that lines up with something surviving in sources such as myths, cult practices, or philosophy. The idea behind the UPG, SPG, VPG verification system is that the ancients likely understood the gods better than most modern pagans, as they were raised in a culture that collectively honored them from birth to death, and thereby likely had a strong working knowledge of the character of the gods. Modern pagans, on the other hand, largely are reconstructing or reviving modernized traditions from scratch, and thereby have to work a lot harder to understand our gods, especially in the early part of their practice. It's meant to help instill confidence in new pagans who might be struggling with latent Christianity. See my video on the topic for how that could hurt pagans early on in their past, and also to protect against misinformation being spread by folks who claim to have privileged information from the gods, or who want to impress a community that they just joined by fabricating a wild experience to try and establish some kind of credibility or authority in the new space. It's also meant to be largely personal. What way you give to interpretations confirmed by sources is supposed to be up to you individually, as many ways that we can have divine experiences in the modern day couldn't possibly be understood by the ancients. For example, I know a number of folks, myself included, that have had divine experiences brought on by music streaming platforms forcing a particular song or suddenly amping up the volume during particular lyrics that pertain to something they were struggling with or had prayed about earlier in the day. Well, you could stretch the idea regarding one of the oracles where someone would ask a question, cover their ears, run to the agora until exhausted, and the first words they hear when they uncover them be the answer is perhaps analogous. The fact remains that the technology and lifestyle most of us live today was beyond the scope of what the ancients could imagine. 
We've also either lost access to many sources due to the disruption over the course of history, or the sources that could confirm a UPG as VPG could be obscure and expensive to access, thereby leaving the divine experience that could be confirmed under the system in the ether until someone who both knows the reference and accepts the reference as part of their paradigms regarding the divine is around to verify it. This could create power dynamics in communities where people who outwardly appear to be experts, or who have leadership in the community but may not be as educated on specific kinds of divine experiences, end up with a lot of power over what is communally accepted as VPG. Let me give you an example. There's a certain branch of Platonism that believes all of the gods don't interact with humans directly or have relationships with us at all, that all experiences are in fact mediated through daimons. They might dismiss all of the examples I gave in part one of Epiphania as daimons manifesting to deliver messages, and may also dismiss certain calls to positions regarded in Platonic traditions, such as the position of Goethes, or necromantic servants of Hecate and Persephone, or calls to the mystery rites such as the Dionysian mysteries as the work of Gak Daimons, or malicious spirits who wish to pull humanity away from the gods. A person who heavily favors Theogony might dismiss Athena's associations with gulls and stormbirds in Megara, thereby leading someone who wishes to confirm a dream where a message is sent in that guise to a different conclusion. There's also the bias of what kind of sources to privilege. We don't exactly have a Bible or other authoritative text in any reconstructed or revived tradition. Even in Hellenism, where the epics by Hesiod and Homer were often appealed to by the ancients as divinely inspired, divine inspiration didn't mean anything close to biblical inerrancy. And there are numerous other sources in addition to the epics, like plays, oracular consultations and answers, historians who documented history and antiquity, travelers like Pausanias who documented places they visited or stories that they heard about places they could visit and the religious significance, hymns written both in the mid and later antiquity to the gods reflecting changes in cult beliefs, and the vast archeological data that can sometimes point to a difference in viewpoints between those writing and the common illiterate people. Remember what I said about the Goethes? Surviving evidence of katadesmoi, or curse tablets, and oracular declarations by Delphi make it pretty clear to the average person, and the highest confirming oracle in the land, it was a respectable profession that was a necessity in Greek society. Sometimes this privilege of sources starts to look like polytheists looking for that biblical authority, when part of the joy of our traditions is that we don't have that by the nature of our religions. It starts to look more like arguments about which books of the Bible are actually important in Christian circles than a celebration of the diversity of experiences and viewpoints that these traditions represent. And again, we have the issue of access. Finding information on the questions asked and answers given at oracles is much harder than finding translations of plays, philosophers, and ethics. They're just not as available outside of scholarly circles. Which brings us to scholarship and its bias, which I've covered in both a live stream and a previous video, link in the iCard above to the video, as well as struggles that many of us have being outside the culture and, and interpreting the myths. Someone who takes the Iliad literally and doesn't know much about Athenian cult practice may conclude that because they worship Poseidon, Athena will want nothing to do with them. Even though Athena and Poseidon were often honored in the same civic festivals and their priests would walk side by side in festivals like Panathenia. Without knowledge of the Homeric hymn to Ares, someone might conclude that he is a bloodthirsty monster and discount an offer for assistance with battleborn PTSD. Someone who has read scholars declaring the Muses minor deities and decline during the Hellenistic era might not understand a dream where they're told to invoke them first and last in poetry that they're working on for them. And don't get me started on the shade and attitude thrown by Christian scholars, particularly pre-1980, on all things polytheist. The monograph I read on votive offerings for the video on the topic contained constant put-downs regarding the sins of pride and vanity for people inscribing their names on votive offerings with little consideration on why someone might do so within the cultural paradigms of religious Hellenism. F.S. Naiden in Smoke Signals for the Gods criticizes scholarship for repeatedly dismissing the, as he puts it, perceived relationship between the divine and humans at work in offering sacrifices and prayers, even though one might think that when one is sacrificing and praying to a deity that the god's opinion and interaction in that position might have a lot to do with why that's happening. Maybe. I don't know, scholars seem to think differently than the rest of us sometimes. These problems are exacerbated even further in traditions with fewer surviving written sources. I can barely imagine what it must be like for Gaulish and Celtic reconstructionists working primarily off of secondary sources written by a hostile culture and linguistics for their sourcing. Divine experiences and epiphanies, particularly collective ones, must play a much larger role in their work. If these experiences are limited in their value to only what can be confirmed by a potentially biased scholar, there aren't a lot of valid experiences for people reviving paths without a ton of sources. 
This ultimately leads certain communities to privilege those who have the time, energy, and financial access to resources, regardless of their potential biases over those who don't. Which, if those people have good intentions, may not seem like a problem, but it also points to the issues of both ableism and classism that can easily develop in group settings if people aren't careful. Sometimes, community leaders or people with particularly loud voices in communities can end up blocking off potential interpretations simply due to lack of knowledge on their part. If someone shares a divine experience in a group event regarding a specific deity and the leader gives an interpretation or opinion as to whether or not that experience is confirmable, then others in that group may hear that and not share or do any of their own investigation because they're leaning on the authority of the group leader. It's easy to forget under group pressure that your divine experiences are yours for you. And so long as you're not trying to privilege them as applying to others or lording yourself as some kind of authority over others, it's between you and the gods what weight you give them and your interpretations of them. Although the VPG system can feel like effective training wheels for many starting on their path, as many of us get deeper in, I find that the divinatory method of confirmation ends up being far more useful in the long run. This can especially apply when dealing with future larger communities and communal epiphanies such as visions shared during a communal rite by multiple members, dreams that occur on the same day by multiple members, or the call to establish a new cult site in the case of an IRL group of some kind. Conversations about how we treat divine experiences and what methods of confirmation and by whom we find acceptable are a must going into the future if we want our movements to grow and thrive, and if we want to grow and thrive as individual pagans and polytheists. I want to stress that the issues I have aren't with the idea of learning the lore and surviving sources and talking about things in the community as they related to surviving sources. My issue is with framing all divine experiences experiences under this singular, not very descriptive header and the issues that come from that. UPG, SPG, and VPG encapsulate epiphanies, omens, and blessings all under their header, though due to this at times it can be hard to use the system to interpret or classify which kind of dying experience something might be without further education on the traditional recognized kinds of manifestation. The terms also don't distinguish between the divine experiences themselves and their interpretations or the change in practice and belief that you might have as a result of the experience. These were entirely separate categories in ancient times, and for good reason. One can have a genuine encounter with the divine and interpret that encounter completely wrong. That's why oracles were used for confirmation, and distinguishing between an omen and a manifestation can have major effects on the interpretation of an experience, both of which would require an interpretation where a blessing might only entail a thanks for the god involved. An experience being verified is likely divine based on the sources, say if you had a bird omen from a polon involving corvids, just gives you some level of confidence that that experience was indeed divine. We've lost so much from ancient ornithomancy that you might not have enough information to confirm an interpretation without divination. Gnosis means knowledge. Can you call an experience without an interpretation gnosis? I don't even need to get into the fights that have broken out in the community over what does and does not count as UPG. The term is so nebulously defined, I've seen and participated in numerous arguments regarding its definition and use, and the inevitable it's how you define it that comes afterwards does little to accentuate its use as either an epistemological framework for verifying experiences that are or are not divine, or a valuable community shorthand for discussing those experiences after the fact. Beyond that, I think the terms distance us from our own experiences by their very nature. Which sounds more intimate and close to you? I had a UPG with Athena in my dreams, or Athena appeared in my dreams. I had a UPG with Hermes involving traffic lights on the way to work today, or or Hermes blessed my trip to work today with green lights. Are we so afraid of feeling crazy that we're willing to reclassify our experiences as something else? In ancient times, if someone had an experience with a god and didn't know who they were, they would call it a divine experience or omen and ask for confirmation and divination. Do we really need these confusing, unclear terms to protect ourselves from undue influence by others in the community? There's something to be said for the fact that every explanation of UPG, SPG, and VPG in the community has to stress that these experiences can be valid without being verified. It's clear that the hierarchy issue she was created from the outset by the system established by these terms. I also want to stress that it's entirely your decision how much weight you want to put on any system of confirmation or community input on divine experiences that you have. Your relationship, your goddess with the gods, is your own and so is that of your household. The community goddess is a part of this but cannot be all of it, and we need to be careful in how we privilege those with access to sources, not because it's wrong for some people to know more, but because it can easily become a power play where specific interpretations of certain kinds of divine experiences become canon 
women in a community and other potentially accurate interpretations are ignored in favor of the status quo. Keep in mind, I'm not advocating that we should ignore lore entirely when it comes to divine experiences. We'd be throwing away an invaluable resource from the ancients in understanding our gods. At the same time, we cannot allow our traditions to become completely fossilized to what a bunch of literate ancient rich guys deign to write down for us. Part of why I built this channel is to make resources more accessible to the community on the whole, but even I regularly admit my own bias toward both older and Athenian sources due to my own path. It's important to be respectful of one another and not dismiss divine experiences if the initial interpretation doesn't seem to line up with the gods as we know them from myth. There may be a source that's lost or buried, or this may be a new experience. There's a value in tradition, and some things like human blood offerings should never become a part of our modern traditions. But there also must be room to grow and change, both as individuals and as communities, both IRL and online. The terms UPG, SPG, and VPG aren't very useful in the long run, for all of the reasons I've outlined. I think it's far more useful to label blessings, omens, and epiphanies as what they are, and simply use plain language to indicate whether your opinion or belief stems from the lore, an experience, or an experience that has reference to the lore. I don't think we need special, vague terms for that. We're perfectly capable of calling out people who assert personal experiences as fact that contradicts surviving sources without extra terms that muddy the waters and provoke arguments while creating systems of hierarchy. Letting go of these terms might allow the community to take its collective focus off of validating whether or not our individual experiences are in fact divine and place it on interpreting what they might mean for us individually and on the whole. Liars are gonna lie no matter what words we use to call them out on their lies. People are gonna try to pass off their personal experiences as fact for others, whether we use three-letter acronyms to call them out or merely do so on the grounds of history. For our movements to thrive, we need to be able to own our personal experiences as what they are and not shy away from them using distancing language. Language. If nothing else, I want to challenge the base assumptions about this framework and provoke a discussion in the community. Because from my view at least, it doesn't seem to be serving any of the purposes I've heard people espouse for it. But I'm curious what you all think. Let me know down in the comments what functions you think the system can serve in the modern day, if any. And if you're new here, help the stunned subscribe button up from the floor and offer the like to the glorious algorithm. Special thanks also to my patrons. You all encouraged me to fall down this rabbit hole when I was struck by inspiration while working on the Circle Back Offerings video. I don't know if I would have had the fortitude to dive as deep as I did without y'all's encouragement. May the cycle of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.